I had my microphone as my speaker and my speaker as my microphone. Okay, great. Let's get started. Um, we're going to be talking about linear regression today. We sort of switch gears a little bit. And there's a lot of material that we're going to cover today. Um, I'm not going to do everything justice. I'm kind of trying to cover some relatively new stuff that has been really interesting. And I think a, a good way of thinking about these topics, um, I'm hoping I think a lot of these things, you'll have seen one version of it, and I'm hopefully going to give you a new perspective on it. Um, really, today, we're going, to, we're going to focus on just the simple linear model, which has a lot kind of already in there, very built in. And um, it's going to, sorry, I'm just trying to make it so that I guess I can't do anything to stop. I wanted to turn off this chime when he comes in, but I guess I don't know how to do that. Um, anyway. The, what we're going to be talking about today is, you know, we've been doing a lot on identification. I would say really the first four classes, we're really trying to emphasize this idea of what kind of estimates could we know given the data generating process? Like what is something that we can invert out of the data generating process into some sort of knowable um, estimate? What I want to talk about today, although obviously the idea of what estimates you're using is um, going to matter, I want to talk about sort of given an estimator for these estimates. I want to talk about really uncertainty and inference. So when we talk about inference, what we're trying to say, it, uncertainty is almost a better term for this, is the idea that, look, we're not sure what the truth is, whatever that truth is that we want to know, e.g. the estimate. So let's try and figure out kind of how much uncertainty we, we want to quantify in it. Um, and I think there's a lot in here. And I think this is actually a pretty, um, there's a lot that has been done historically. There's obviously a long, rich history thinking about the linear model and inference, but I do think that there are some modern innovations on this that we're gonna talk about today that I find a lot more intuitive, um, especially given the focus on research design. So let's start with some notation just for the purposes of this. Hopefully I won't, <laughs> well, I already have a typo in the first one. Um, so that's not a good sign, but, just for purposes of notation, we're going to be thinking about some causal variable D, DI, which could be continuous valued. A lot of times we're going to focus on the binary case. Um, that should be DN. Really, it's the idea that when I have bold symbols, the idea is just to denote that there's some sort of, um, it's some sort of vector or matrix versus being a, um, the, the value for a single person. There's some outcome. And there's some set of controls, which sometimes we're going to be conditioning on. This is not really, a, we're not going to worry too much about the controls, but they obviously show up when you do linear regression, right? Sometimes when you do linear regression, you have your thing you care about, and then you got to dump in a bunch of controls. They might be fixed effects. They might be linear, um, linear continuous controls, what have you. We're going to go back to Sutfer world. We're not thinking about these spillover problems, at least for the purposes of identification. Um, we're going to talk about spillovers in terms of inference, but we're not going to focus on it for the purposes of pure effects or um, spatial interactions. And we're going to assume that you know we have some kind of conditional exogeneity, st um, strict ignorability holds in some way. So that's the starting point. So really think of this as like, it's the best possible scenario. Regression works. And now we want to talk about how should we be quantifying our uncertainty. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start by being in the world that I think everyone should be really familiar with. So, you know, we'll think about a regression. We'll have YI. We have some set of controls XI. That includes a constant. And then we have the variable that we're interested in, DI. Um, we're interested in tau. And then we have some epsilon term. Right, and epsilon here is like the universal term for idiosyncrasy, right? This idiosyncratic noise. And what's notable in the model-based framework, right, is that we think about the idea that there's a, we kind of know X, we know D, and epsilon is driving the uncertainty. We, this, is, this is the extent to which we have um, model uncertainty comes from these epsilons. So when we want to estimate tau and gamma, that's where we get all of our uncertainty from in this model-based setting. This is probably something that like you understand algebraically, but it's really, given that we spent some time in the design-based world, it's kind of worth emphasizing this again. So think about now we just stack everything. So the X's and the D's are stacked. If there were no controls, this would just, X would just be a constant and we'd just be estimating some beta, right? And 
when we think about estimating beta, well, we know that beta hat, given that this is the model of the world, beta hat is equal to beta, and then plus this w prime w inverse w prime epsilon, right? So if you're a person who's not super familiar or comfortable with vectors, now's as good a time as any to start getting comfortable with them in the sense that they're very useful. Um, notationally though, I think what I do want to emphasize is I'm going to use these, um, in a lot of places when these are vectors. So WN here is, um, is N by K. So typically when you see an N by K primed some epsilon, we're just saying we're taking the sum of the product. So it's really about, this is a covariance term because epsilon is mean zero. So we're thinking about the covariance of W and epsilon over, um, this WN. And a lot of times in this world, we take uh, WN as given. And so the uncertainty in the world is really driven by the epsilon. So what do I mean by that? Well, consistency or unbiasedness of our estimator typically comes from the idea that we say the expectation of epsilon conditional on WN is equal to zero, right? That's a pretty common assumption you'd say there. If you did that, well, then the expectation of beta hat would be equal to beta. Um, but more interestingly, and what we're going to talk about today is thinking about the variance of beta hat, right? So this V, this, this, um, this, this script B, uh, V is the variance of our estimator, right? So the variance of our estimator is this big thing. It's kind of this mess, but it really just comes from the idea of if we took the variance of this term here, where we took beta hat minus beta, and we took the variance of that, this, that turns into this. And that's because the epsilons are mean zero. And so there's this outer product term of these three. Um, this should be a bold script where we have, um, where we have that this, the key structure here is that this, you have this epsilon and epsilon, which is going to be the outer product of so that's a typo. It should be epsilon, epsilon prime, which is going to be the outer product of the epsilon. So just I'm going to keep track in the background just in case you can't see this, but epsilon is n by one. And so if we think about epsilon, epsilon prime, that's going to, this thing here is going to be some n by n matrix, right? And so we have this matrix here, we'll call it sigma n. And that's usually everything in what we're gonna think about for estimators here is gonna pivot around the idea of understanding the structure of this matrix. So, you know, right now I've told you nothing about it. I've told you it's something that's n by n. And what a lot of us start with when we think about this is we, we focus on the case of homoscedasticity, right? We say, okay, well, actually, this um, omega matrix can be written as sigma squared, where sigma is some scalar, right? Times the identity matrix that's n by n. So this complicated thing goes from being undefined, where um, I'm going to switch the camera in just a second so you can see it. But it goes from being this thing that has arbitrary entries in it to being something where you have just a scalar and then and then um, ones along the diagonal. And let me switch this so you can see it if you wanted to look. So that's a pretty restrictive assumption, um, but it really simplifies our variance. This is why everyone likes to focus on it. So if you think about the homoscedastic case, then, then the variance of beta is just equal to sigma squared and then this um, inverse of the variance of our regressors. So what, is, what does that mean when we assume this? Well, the content of this assumption is that the error terms across observations are equal to zero. There's no common errors across them. And that the variance of epsilon is just constant irrespective of the Ws. So it doesn't matter what treatment you get, you always have the same variance. And we're gonna come back to this, but that's not innocuous, right? It's kind of saying above and beyond the treatment you get, you're, you, if, you got, if you're in the control group or in the treatment group, 
kind of the variance of what your outcome looks like is the same. And so your treatment is kind of just moving you up and down because the rest of you, it doesn't, um, doesn't vary. So that's a pretty strong assumption. And then the typical estimator for how we do this um, is we're gonna plug in, we need something to plug in for sigma squared. We'll calculate sigma squared by taking the, um, the squared sum of the residuals where the epsilon hats are just the residuals that come from, we run the regression and we subtract the predicted value off of the true, um, uh, true value. And then that's our residual. We take the sum of those squared errors. Um, this shouldn't be squared. This should be just be n. This should be the minus one. So it should be divided by n minus k minus one. So that's sort of day one on econometrics. Typically, under heteroscedasticity, um, you know, we have this uh, we have this assumption where that the variance of epsilon i conditional on w i now is allowed to vary as a function of um, WI, right? So now we're saying, okay, well, it depends on what the value of your regressors. And so it may, um, it may not be constant uh, depending on what the treatment value is. So the traditional graph you'll see, right, is like the fanning out um, as you move across regressors, but it can come in a number of ways. And so the typical robust estimator that people will use here, this comes from, so Ecker, Huber, and White are the usual uh, sites for this. And it's pretty straightforward. What you need to do now is basically this heteroscedasticity estimator, if we remember what is the content of that assumption, well, now we've weakened the assumption about it being constant. So it's no longer sigma squared times an identity, but it's still only along the diagonals, right? So our estimator now has gone from being the same value along the diagonals to now we're having different values along the diagonals, but all the off diagonals are equal to zero. So you can solve for this in the sense that nothing, right now we just need to plug in. We had to just figure out a feasible estimator for this middle term here in equation one. Well, what we do is we plug in in the same way with these um, epsilon i squared, which is the residuals times this um, WI, WI prime. Now, what's notable about this, and this may or may not be obvious when you took the class and maybe this was very clear, is that you know, epsilon hat I squared is not a feasible, it's not a consistent estimator of the underlying variance. So we actually don't need to know um, the variance for each term. All we really need to know is plug in something good enough such that when we sum up over everything, this is gonna converge. And so, this is pretty common anytime if you had data and you did reg y and x comma robust, you know, historically, this is what you would have gotten out of it is, is this estimator. Modulus, some adjustments that we'll talk about in a second. Any questions on this so far? Hopefully this is relatively familiar, but just with more typos in the notation. Okay, great. Um, so what gets more interesting and what I want to talk about first is thinking about the simple dummy case and the content of what it means when we use this estimator, right? So I just jumped into this idea that we want the variance of it. Um, well, so let's talk about the simple dummy case. So now what we have is we have a constant and then we're saying our treatment is a dummy. And so it's easy to show that, well, easy, it is doable to show that what this simplifies down to under the homoscedastic case is that the variance of the homoscedastic estimator is equal to that variance thing that you calculated divided by n0, which is the number of control units, and n1, which is the number of treatment units. All right, so we just, have, we just have binary dummies. Some of you treated, some of you are not. What it's saying is that the variance is just a, the sum of these two. And so, you know, we could make these, they would just be N zeros. Uh, this simplifies in a very easy way, right? In contrast, when you do robust standard errors, remember that we're saying that the variance of the errors varies depending on if the, you're untreated or if you're treated. So you're taking this weighted sum of these two values, right? So why does that matter? Well, remember the whole reason why we do this stuff is because we want confidence intervals, right? Like no, the reason typically of why you are interested in the variance of your estimator is because 
what we do is we do the following. We say, we're willing to assume that our estimator is approximately normal or t student T. Then we say, all right, given that variance, we can talk about a 95% confidence interval around our estimator that captures basically um, the overall confidence interval of our estimator, right? So we can get an estimate and then we can talk about a confidence intervals around that estimate. Well, this is where sort of the, the rubber meets the road. So our distributional assumptions come from the following types of statistics, right? So typically what we do is we take our, est our estimator or our estimate beta hat, we subtract off beta. So we don't know beta, but when we're doing confidence intervals, you know, this is, we're normalizing it based off of the, the true value. Where, so we're taking beta hat, we're dividing by the estimate of the, the variance, right? So typically it's the, uh, we're dividing by the, by the standard error. And when we know that the distribution of epsilon is normal, we know the exact distribution of this statistic capital T under homoscedasticity. So for those of you who remember this, like this is basically saying if you do the linear normal model under homoscedasticity, that you get an exact finite sample distribution for this capital T, right? This is where the T statistic comes from. And we, you, it, this is this capital T is called pivotal. So whatever, who cares? It, that's just interesting, but obviously we never assume that stuff is homoscedastic or that it's normal. Well, when we, um, well, so, okay, so let me explain a little bit. So the reason for this, that it's, it's we, we know that the distribution of this is that's because beta hat is normally distributed under the, the CLT. And if you take that normal divided by the square root of the variance, which is distributed chi-squared, then what happens is that you get an exact student T distribution. So what comes from it, and I know this seems like a lot of notation, but it, the payoff is gonna come next slide, is that when we take something that's standard normal and we divide by a chi-squared, where scaled by the degrees of freedom, that this gives us exactly a student T. So what we're doing when we do these types of statistics is we're trying to say, well, if we took a normal and we scale correctly by the right variance, that what happens is, is that what we get is we get something that's distributed as a, either a normal if the degrees of freedom is large enough or when it's the degrees of freedom is finite, we get something that's student T with some kind of degrees of freedom. The, what happens though is that it's all about what is this chi-square distribution. So this chi-square distribution is coming from our approximation of the variance. So this variance estimator here, V hat, is what we're dividing our beta hat by. Well, what happens when it's normal and it's homoscedastic, that's just exactly a chi-squared. But when things aren't normal, that this isn't exactly true. It only holds asymptotically. And so what happens is that we say, okay, this is asymptotically pivotal. We can assume this thing about the student distribution. That's fine. But what the, when you don't have homoscedasticity, this, is, this basically becomes much more complicated. And the reason is, is that how do we think about N1 and N0 um, in this context? So take this V hat estimator. Notice how there's this combination of two variances, the variance of the untreated and the variance of the treated. Well, this is weighted average where this thing is kind of converging, but if one is fixed and one is not, then things gets more complicated. And so what do I mean by this? This is called, what we're gonna be talking about is called the Barron's fisher problem. So remember this confidence, confidence interval, the way that we construct it is we say, all right, take beta hat, subtract off, some critical value, which is a T distribution with degrees of freedom N or N minus two, depending on sort of what adjustment you're doing. And for the 0.975, right? So if we're doing 95% on two-sided, we do uh, the 9 point, uh, 0.975 critical value. And we're gonna subtract and add that multiplied by square root of the variance of the estimator. That's the standard error, right? The trick is when we construct this statistic in the heteroscedastic case, we're not dividing by the right finite sample variance. So remember that 
this variance is the weighted sum of two different chi-squared distributions. So this, this V beta hat HW, Ecker Huber white variance, well, we have one variance, which is, this is a chi-squared scaled by N zero. And then this is a different one with a totally different set of properties that has a different variance scaled by N one. And you're like, okay, so what? Well, what we've said is that we've constructed this estimator here, which is this weighted combination of two things. Well, the weighted combination of two chi-squareds is not exactly right for what the true underlying distribution of this beta hat is. In the limit, it ends up working out because everything sort of normalizes out in the limit. But with any given finite sample, that's not the case. So why does that matter? Um, and then we're going to get to this idea of how do we think about um, asymptotics more generally. But say we had a data set where the number treated is much smaller than the number untreated. So think about a lot of cases in medical circumstances, or, or this is this is kind of a classic case is the Barron's Fisher problem. So N0, let's say it's much bigger than N1. So lots of untreated, very few treated. Then really, then if we look at this Ecker, um, the EHW variance, well, if N0 is really, really large, then this term in the, in the, on the left is basically zero, right? It kind of, it gets very, very small. And all of the variance here is driven by this second term. But remember how the whole point of this chi-square that we're thinking about for the degrees of freedom, it's all a function of what the denominator is in, in this, um, this chi-squared. And the denominator here is N1. So the whole point is, is that it could be N0, it could be N1, it could be N, which is the sum of the two of them. But as you let N0 get really, really big, the, the dominant variance that matters is the thing that has a degrees of freedom that's very small. So what that ends up doing is that the, the thing you should be basically adjusting for when you think about the variance for when you have a very small number of treated estimators is you should be really doing the correct degrees of freedom for N1. You should be using the right degrees of freedom. And so, okay, why does that matter? This seems like, can you imagine asking this in the seminar? It's like you're embarrassed to ask this kind of question. But the point is, is like, imagine a confidence interval where you had a degrees of freedom of three. So you had only three treated units and you were doing the 9.75. Well, then you'd be scaling your confidence intervals by three, as opposed to if you had 28 treated units, you'd be scaling by two. Right, so the difference here in your confidence intervals as a function of what your right degrees of freedom is can matter a lot, especially in these smaller settings. And what's notable is, I'm not gonna talk about it today for this paper. This problem also holds when thinking about clustering, right? So imagine you had many, many, say you have all 50 states, but only one of them is treated. Then the same problem holds in this setting. Like you really are thinking about the wrong degrees of freedom for this particular problem. Um, I, I want to kind of pause here for a second. This kind of blew my mind when thinking about it. I know we really delved into it, but the point is that in these finite samples, thinking about what is the right scaling thing is, is what's going on. You've got this problem in which you have um, this piece that feels like just um, algebra, but it's actually this idea of like, what do you get? Where's your uncertainty coming from? Well, it's your uncertainty is coming from the side, the fact that there's not very many that are treated in this. You have a lot more uncertainty. Let me kind of just show you um, this simulation. Actually, this is useful. And I'm going to say this a number of times today because it's kind of like something I, worth harping on is asymptotics are just approximations, right? So what we're trying to do is we don't know what things are distributed as. What's nice is that if you do certain scalings and you have certain properties that things start to be well behaved. So in this case, um, the point is, is that when we talk about things being asymptotically pivotal, the point is, is that it's not an unreasonable distribution. Um, it's a not an unreasonable assumption to say that if you take this uh, a coefficient from say OLS and you scale it by its standard error, that that actually kind of tends to behave like um, a student T distribution. And that's kind of how we think about confidence intervals. By the same notion, actually, it works pretty well in this case too to do it in this setting, but um, what we we just have to have much fatter tails to get the right coverage for thinking about what the actual uncertainty of this estimator looks like. If that if that makes sense, Daniel. So like you you would still do decently well. And actually, this is good. So let me just talk about. So in the paper, they do this is um, 
By the way, this is the Imbids and Colasar paper that I'm talking about. So in this paper, they do a couple simulation examples. And what they say is, you know, we're going to do a really simple linear regression. We have a binary um, dummy treatment. We're going to have errors that are normally distributed, but they're heteroscedastic. So it's conditional on treatment. And what they're going to do is they're going to hold fix the variance of the treated group, but then vary the variance of the untreated. So initially, the untreated will be substantially smaller and then go all the way to twice as big. So go from half to twice as big. And the point is, is that 27 are untreated, um, three are treated. And then it's just showing the relative performance um, of these of these variance estimators. So this is the coverage. So what they do is they simulate it and then they see whether or not the confidence interval covers the true parameter. So this is saying, take the 95% confidence interval is beta, is the true beta inside that? Uh, do that, you know, a thousand times. What share of them have that? It should be 95%. That's sort of what frequentist asymptotics do. And the point is, is so BM is for Bell McCaffrey, which is what this, um, what the proposed solution is going to do. And basically the point is, is that the, this adjustment does reasonably well, even in cases, you know, along all these ones, it's roughly 95%. It's a little um, overly conservative in the sense that it, it's wide. The bigger your coverage is, the more conservative you're being, right? Your, your common intervals are too big because you're covering lots of stuff. And you can see all these other ones kind of suck, right? So homoscedastic is way too, um, lenient initially but very tight and then it's super conservative subsequently and these other ones are um these are these other methods that are not adjusting for degrees of freedom do quite poorly so they're not they're not sufficiently conservative um, as a result of this so um kind of the point of this paper is to say you can also this generalizes to the general regression setting even without the binary problem so the simple um Example to think about is if you have a super highly skewed right hand side variable. So if you have something that's log normally distributed, you're still going to have potentially this problem that you have these regressors where there's just some stuff that's very far down in the tail. There's very few of them who are out there. You want to adjust for that um, in your variance estimator, regardless when thinking about this robust, um, this robust estimator. And the whole idea is that the variance we're scaling by is not a chi squared um, distribution, is not a chi squared um, variable with the full degrees of freedom, that is n. You need to match the underlying chi squared as best you can, like you have to do an approximation to it. And so what they propose in this paper is to push on this thing called by Bell and McCaffrey from 2003 that tries to match the distribution. So in the binary case, it's easier because the intuition is very straightforward. In general regression setting, you have to be like, okay, well, what is the chi squared? And it's this high dim higher dimensional thing um, that you have to approximate. And so what they do is they say, all right, let's pick the degrees of freedom that match the first and second moment of the chi squared such that we can get a good approximation. And this will account for these types of things. And it does quite well um, in this setting. This is not something that I'm expecting you, I mean, maybe for a homework, I'll ask you to do it, but these are not things like when you're doing research that you should be needing to do the the you know stata does 90 percent of it right so like the big chunk that it does is it does the standard errors correctly it kind of makes the it makes them unbiased in finite samples but it doesn't do these bell mccaffrey adjustments in part because i mean it's a pretty big um a, it's a it's a pretty big adjustment in some settings and you might need to sort of decide what you want to do in Stata, you can use this package called Reg Sandwich, I think is the main one that I found that works. In R, there's several that work. I think Club Sandwich, they're all, the reason they're called Sandwich is because it's like the sandwich estimator is what the variance estimator is called. So um, this Club Sandwich one, I think is, is kind of the most promising. This estimator one is also quite good. Col Michael Colasar has a repo, oh boy, sorry. Um, has a repo that does this, but I would say it's, I mean, you can take a look at it. I think the club sandwich one is better. The point is, is that all of these are sort of approximations mm -hmm. and it's really kind of useful to think about because in many settings, we're going to have these types of things. I, I, I want to kind of point to this is that this is a challenging problem that can show up in some settings that can have really big impacts. And it seems like a kind of innocuous, but actually can be a big deal. Um, yeah. Okay. So... Now let's talk about uncertainty. So I kind of led with this purposefully 
saying, or we're talking about model-based uncertainty. We have this epsilon thing. Hopefully it's super familiar for all of you in the audience that you've seen the idea of, oh, I've got epsilons and I'm, the epsilons get small, right? That's like not a, that's not a challenging thing because it's what you've been learning in econometrics class for the past couple of years. So what I'm going to propose today, and I, I, this is, I think, becoming a theme in this class is saying that you know, how should we think about inference and kind of what is our perspective on what we're trying to do for our estimand matters a lot. How should we think about in, um, inference? What does epsilon mean? So typically, if you read textbooks or if you kind of understand the literature that this comes from, this is coming from sampling perspective. So the idea is that we have a small sample from a broader population. So we have some population and we're getting repeated drawn samples from it. And the uncertainty comes from whether or not these estimates reflect the true underlying population. Right, that's the idea behind this, and these epsilons are supposed to reflect that. This is very different, right? So I kind of hit you guys with this when we were talking about all this design-based stuff. Is hey, that's not what uncertainty is. The uncertainty is not about sampling; it's about the fundamental problem of causal inference, namely that you don't observe both outcomes for the same person. The trick with this model-based uncertainty, which is this idea of sampling, is you know, as an applied person, you might you might start being like, okay, well, I got access to the census. Now I have every observation in the US. How do, why am I running, why do I have standard errors? Right, you might say like, I just know what, I know what the relationship is. Or, you know, another one that's good. I almost put this quote, if, I'll send this quote out. Like, it's like, how do you think about sampling? New, what's the super, pop, what's the population of the United States when we have all 50 states? Like, how do you think about inference there? Um, we still have uncertainty, right? And that's because of this uncertainty that's driven by the um, by causal inference, by the assignment of our treatments that we're interested in. So what I'm gonna talk about now is this paper that I really think is very powerful. I got made fun of because it's apparently, this is like really hits my wheelhouse on types of econometrics papers I like. But it's this Abadi et al. econometrica paper, which I really recommend you take a look at after this if you're interested. Um, where they're now trying to combine these two things that we've talked about. So there's this sampling-based uncertainty and this design-based uncertainty to try and kind of um, talk about these in a unified way. And they do this for thinking about linear regression. So now let's think about there being two sources of uncertainty. There's a population, which is finite for now. Eventually we could let it become infinite, but it's of size N. And then we have some sample size, which is less than or equal to the population, right? You could have the full population. And then you have some indicator which denotes whether or not you observe it, right? So you could have repeat, but R here is denoting whether or not you observe it. And then we have potential outcomes as well in the same way. I'm denoting it here with a Y star to just make it easier, which is driven by this treatment assignment, this DI. So now we got them both, right? We have sampling uncertainty, we have design-based uncertainty, and you notice they kind of reflect different things, right? So Sampling uncertainty is this, well, how much does the estimate from our sample reflect the underlying thing in the population versus the design-based uncertainty, which is, well, does the causal comparison that we're doing reflect the true causal effect that is in the population? So what's really nice in this paper is you can combine the two to think about this, which lets us think about, okay, you know, internal validity versus external validity, right? So this is this thing is like, now we can think about in the sample, we have a causal estimate, we have a population causal estimate, we can think about what's the validity that we're comparing to. So there's a lot in the paper, I'm going to talk about just the binary case in this. Um, um, the paper considers the full idea of linear regression, um, binary right hand side variable seems like a perfectly good place to start and make stuff easier. This kind of three estimands that they talk about that you might be interested in, right? So the estimand is just saying, here's what I want to know. And right, so the descriptive thing that you might want to know is a population. Oh, and I really apologize about this in the sense that I do different N and little N and big N than they do. So it, when you read this, I'm really sorry, but I just, I'm just so used to doing it in my way that it's, it's the opposite. Anyway, um, big N, remember, is the population N, and little N is the sample N in my setting. So anyway, theta descriptive is just the difference between um, the treated population or the outcomes for those who have the treatment turned on and the outcome for the people who have the treatment turned off in the population. 
um, the causal inference measure is saying, okay, well, for the sample that we observe, what's the difference between them? And then there's a true population causal estimate, right? So in the limit, if we let capital N go to infinity, this would just be an expectation operator. And then we just have this single estimator that we usually consider, right? We have an, obs an observed sample. We can only observe that one. And, um, and so what we consider is we consider some estimator hat, which is just the sum of the observed variables. Um, where the treatment is on and the one that's off. And what's really interesting about this, right, is that there's two pieces of uncertainty. There's R, which is the sampling uncertainty, and there's D, which is the treatment uncertainty. And now we can start talking about, well, what is the variance and the sampling variance that we have for this? We can condition on D, which is what we were kind of doing under this model uncertainty version in the beginning part of the class. We condition on D and then we just say, all right, let's think about the sampling uncertainty that's there versus conditioning on R, which is focusing on the causal uncertainty within the sample. We condition on what sample we see, and now we want to talk about, all right, well, imagine there was permutations in the treatment assignment. How would that affect our variance? Or we could do both, right? We could think about the variance, the total variance overall. So what are these variants? So just, I'm going to do this. I'm putting these up here. Not They're in the paper. You can go look at them yourself, but it's useful to kind of think about um, some thought experiments that go with this. So what are the variances that are there? Well, the first one is that sampling variance I was telling you about. So you can think about the variance of the estimator conditional on the treatments. And then don't worry too much about these conditioning ones. These are just saying like, let's hold fixed the number of treatments, like in treatment and untreat. You could probably allow those to vary, but that really makes life complicated. So we're taking this variance, holding fix it, and then we're just averaging over the possible treatments. So this variance here is going to be really dealing with the idea of like, what's the variation that comes from the sampling? So the fact that we only see a subsample of the data, what does what our variance of our estimator look like? Um, in the sense that I want to know what it would look like if I had the whole population, as I, because I have a small sample, what does that do? The design-based one, which is saying, all right, condition on the sample, what's the variation that comes from randomizing um, D? And then the last one is, is allowing for the variation in both. So just as an aside, I didn't write out these terms, but they should be hopefully relatively straightforward. These are just variants. You know, these are the, the within treatment variation, the with, within control variation. And this is allowing those cross correlations between the treated and the untreated, um, these terms. We usually ignore this last term. This is what we talked about when we were talking about Fisherian, um, sorry, the Neiman uh, variance estimator, the, the first or second day of class. Basically, we usually ignore this because it's not feasible to estimate it. So, but anyway, the point is that there's just these variance terms that are here. There's some really interesting thought experiments that you can do now when you think about this. So one thing is, let little n get small relative to big n. So let the population get really, really large. Well, you can start to see what happens in the sampling case, right? Well, that's basically making this variance larger, right? Because big n1 will get big relative to little n1. And so then the, these terms will get larger. Whereas if we have a lot of the population, we this sampling variation is smaller because we've seen actually a decent chunk of the population. We don't have to assume that it's a tiny, tiny share, an infinitesimal share. Um, it's also really interesting to point out that the, the if you contrast the design-based uh, variance and the sampling-based variance, it's, there's actually not an ordering necessarily between one versus the other because of just these other terms that like there, there's not a strict ordering between the two. One could be bigger than the other when thinking about causal inference versus sampling inference. And then the last thing is that um, what's worth noting is that basically ignoring the fact that there's a finite sample, that we have some finite share of the sample is going to lead us to overstate the variance. When we're interested in a causal estimate, say we take this, um, this variant, this number three term, and we're interested in this, if we let the population go to infinity, so we're saying basically that's a version of our thought experiment one where we're letting N1 and N0 go to infinity, this last term disappears, right? And we're just thinking about these two components. 
Well, the idea that they talk about in the paper is to say, well, actually, if your sample population is relatively large when compared to the overall population. So for any of you, so I work in a lot, I haven't used these yet, but I work a lot with the consumer credit panel, which is a 5% random sample of all credit reports in the United States. That's like a non-negligible share of all credit reports in the United States. You might imagine that this could play a role. And actually what would happen if we do this correctly and if I did the things in their paper, I might actually have smaller standard errors relative to what I would do because having a non-negligible share of the population decreases it. This is a, you know, this is a minus relative. You can adjust for this component. Um, any questions about that? So what are the key takeaways from this paper? Um, I think some of it for me is a holistic thing. Like I, I want to emphasize this paper, not just because I want you to be able to potentially estimate this later, but um, what I want you to be able to do is think about what is the uncertainty that you're worried about? Is it design-based uncertainty versus is it sampling uncertainty? Um, the, the second thing that I want you to take away is that you know, design-based uncertainty estimates can be smaller than traditional estimates, especially when the sample is large relative to the population. It's really important to define the relevant estimate. If you have 50 states and you're trying to think about uncertainty within those 50 states, you might wanna just ignore the variation that comes from sampling. I mean, this is true for my own work, but I should potentially be thinking about it this way. Um, Basically, then the last thing is, you know, don't get confused by the idea of having uncertainty in your estimates when you're using the population. This comes from design-based uncertainty, not from sampling uncertainty. Any questions so far? My video is really lagging, so, but is the audio okay? I don't know if I... Yeah, okay, good. Any questions? You guys are good? All right. Now we're gonna to pivot to um, this last piece, which is trying to think about, we're, we're, we're not quite pivoting away from the design. So, actually, so let me actually, for the purposes of this, let me say that this stuff is really hard and kind of thinking about design-based inference in these settings is a relatively new thing that um, researchers are working on. So not all the things are sort of solved in this setting. Um, but with that in mind, um, what I'm, we're gonna do now is we're gonna pivot to everything we talked about so far at the most, when if we think back to that matrix where we were um, thinking about the, the covariance matrix of the epsilons, remember everything was off diagonal was zero. And for any of you who work in finance or who do financial um, type approaches, that's obviously, Crazy. So anything with um, time series data, there's typically off diagonal and correlation. That's that's autocorrelation would be a good example of this. Um, and in a lot of even cross sectional settings, you might worry um, about correlation there. So a lot of times we don't have that type of um, off diagonal structure. We instead have something like a clustering structure. So, so it can get very complicated. So what we're gonna start with is a simple version of it, which is the idea that there are clusters that uh, define sort of where the, where the cross correlations can occur. So think about there are people and the clusters are cities or counties or states or countries. Right? So we're just thinking that there's some fixed units where it kind of makes sense to think about aggregate pieces. Um, and we're going to kind of think about the correlation there. Today, we're going to ignore panel data, not because it's not important, but just because it's already complicated thinking about the cross-section. We're going to focus on panel data um, when we start talking about diff and diff and, and these other settings later on in the class. What we can do is we can think about a simple case. So this is the, this is, we're gonna define CI to be a cluster assignment. So think about these as like variables, like denoting what county you're in. So CI is what county you're in. If, and so one very simple way of thinking about um, omega is now that 
you have some homoscedasticity on the diagonal. So if you're the same person, you have a constant variance. And then if you're in the same cluster, but you're not the same person, you have some rho sigma squared. And then if you're not in the same cluster, it's zero. So this is like a block diagonal with a very simple structure. You could allow for much more flexible um, block diagonal structure. So the typical case, like say when you do clustering, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is you'd say something like, well, if you're in the same cluster, you have some sigma ij. And so the key is you've got a bunch of blocks sitting in your um, covariance matrix. The key issue that um, we're not going to talk about, but it's something you want to look into is thinking about the asymptotic, sort of what the size of the cluster is relative to the overall sample size for how good of an approximation this is. OK. Start by thinking about the traditional model-based approach. So let the number of clusters be k sub n or be k. The way that people typically write down the estimator of the variance of beta hat is, this is this um, Liang and Zeger uh, estimator, which is really not very complicated. It's basically analogous to the ecker huber white variance estimator, where now what you're doing is you have these blocks of cor cross correlate cor with, and you have k of them, and so you're summing up over uh, these. So for every block k, you take the outer product of um, the observations, and then you multiply on the outside by these, uh, these w values. So what that's going to do is that's going to capture um, this generalized form of heteroscedasticity within and across units in the cluster. And you can see why the number of clusters matters for asymptotics, because you need capital K to kind of go to infinity in order to get something that's consistent. OK, so now we're going to talk about this is kind of um, where your intuition kind of takes you for a ride. So clustering in this setting, when people have talked about clustering, prior to really the past five or six years, clustering has really talked about the structure of omega. So if you took that really simple case from the last slide, what you can do is you can write down that uh, Liang and Zager estimator as just the homoscedastic estimator, what you'd usually have, right? The, sig the sigma squared, whatever, times just this value, this, this one plus the within, uh, basically within cluster correlation of the epsilons, within cluster correlation of the Ws, and then times this, this uh, N over K. And so this approach, you end up realize, you end up thinking, okay, well, what matters to like juice up whether or not you should cluster is how much within cluster correlation there is. So if there's a lot of within cluster correlation, you worry about that and so you want to cluster on it. And what, there's some language in the paper I'm about to refer to that talks about this, but if you look at, say, Cameron and Miller, for example, and a lot of papers that are advocating for clustering in this, really the approach that is advocated for is to say, you should just cluster on the biggest thing possible. And I've like given this type of advice before. You just say something like, you know, one of you is working on something in the United States and it's something happening at the city level. And you're like, what unit should I cluster on? And I say, well, why don't you cluster on state? And that way you like capture all the potential cross, um, cross correlation that you might be worried about. And, you know, what's challenging about that is the intuition is it's really better to err on the conservative side. That's sort of the uh, why that it's advocating. And what Abadi et al. in this in this 2017 working paper advocate is that you know, the intuition that's kind of formalized, a simple example we did in the last one is really not right once you allow for any type of heterogeneity. And they they give this, it's really worth reading the first couple sections because they walk through a simple example here where what they show is you can have tiny within cluster correlation and large clusters with a lot of data where basically the Liang and Zeger um, estimator is enormous relative to the Ecker Huber White estimator. Um, but you really shouldn't be clustering. You shouldn't be clustering within these units. And the reason is, is it's all about the correlation between W and epsilon in this and heterogeneity across um, the cluster. So in the Abadi et al. example, what they're doing is they're sampling from this population. They have an overall population of 10 million. 
There's 100 equal size clusters. And what they're saying is, okay, we see all the clusters and we have some randomly assigned thing with equal probability. So everybody, it's kind of randomly assigned um, within these places, but some clusters have a positive effect and some of a negative that is exactly equal to zero on average. But what that does is that then if there's heterogeneity in the effects within a cluster, then what it does is it causes a correlation between the treatment and the residual. And so this is coming from, um, and so the question is, okay, well, why do these, these standard errors estimates differ so much? The reason for the difference between the Ecker, Huber, White, and Liang and Zager standard errors is simple, but reflects the fundamental source of confusion in this literature. Given the random assignment, both standard errors are correct, but for different estimates. The Liang and Zager standard errors are based on the presumption that the cluster, there are clusters in the population of interest beyond the 100 clusters seen in the sample. So if we think about the analogy from the last paper we were discussing, it's this idea that there's a population that we've sampled from, and we're, we're talking about uncertainty reflect around that. Whereas the Ecker Huber White standard errors assume that the sample is drawn ram randomly um, from the population of interest, which is what it is. That it's sort of, we see a, a subsample um, of observations, but we see all 100 clusters. It's this presumption underlying the Liang and um, Zhang uh, standard errors of the existence of clusters that are not observed in the sample that, but are part of the population of interest that is critical and often implicit in the model-based motivation for clustering of standard errors. It is of course explicit in the sampling design literature. If we change the setup to one where there are 10,000, a population of 10,000 with 1,000 clusters, but we drew the um, 100 clusters and then sampling units after that, then the standard errors would be right and the Ecker Huber right uh, white standard errors would be wrong. And so the problem is, is with, given a sample, you can't tell if, whether or not these clusters are exist above and beyond. And so you need to kind of know what's going on. So another way of saying this is that if your clusters are the states, it's very likely that that's not the right way of thinking about it. if you have something that's purely randomly assigned, then you don't need to cluster on the states. Now, if the random assignment is at the state level, then you would want to cluster on the state because you have this, um, you have this correlation between the two of them. Okay, so the key takeaway from the paper, um, one is that you really want to cluster your regression at the unit of randomization. Being conservative can be quite bad because it's really kind of leading you to being really off in your inference. Um, and then an important point that I kind of didn't appreciate how much I think there, this is not understood by graduate students is that if you have something where you think you need clusters, putting fixed effects in doesn't change this problem at all. Like fixed effects and inference, once you have any kind of heterogeneity, doesn't solve the problem. This is a kind of, this is a result from Ariano in like 1987, but for some reason is still around. So fixed effects doesn't so remove the need for clustering. Um, we're gonna come back to this um, in panel settings, but you know, I think it's really useful. This, I kind of beat, I looked really stupid online for about three hours yesterday, trying to understand Cardin Kruger um, and think about this in this setting of this. So like, it's a useful exercise and we're gonna come back to it rather than talking about it now, think about Cardin Kruger, which is, if you don't know, it is the canonical paper about minimum wages where they compared um, fast food restaurants in New Jersey versus fast food restaurants in Pennsylvania, where one state changed their minimum wage law. The trick is, is that it's, there's two states, one state changed their law, and then you're comparing the difference of how things change over time in one state versus the other. It's once you start thinking about the unit of randomization and more generally what the estimate is, it becomes really hard to say something truly causal in this. And probably what you're best capturing is just sampling variation. And you'd need really strong assumptions in order to have this be like a broader causal statement about what's going on. Okay. Last thing we're gonna talk about. So now let me, let me pause there for first. Um, I'm gonna turn my video off because it's very distracting because mine is super laggy. Um,
I'm sorry if you wanted to see what I looked like. I, I'm just waving my hands. Does anyone have any questions about this so far? This paper is worth looking at, but I think it will probably give you more questions than answers, unfortunately. I think the main thing that I'd like you to take from it is that thinking about what the S demand is is going to be relevant. And there's a lot of really nice papers that we're going to touch on that are trying to do this um, in the panel setting that I think hopefully will be clearer. Um, and we're going to do that in a couple of weeks. I do think that what I want you to take away from this is that the traditional advice of, hey, be as conservative as possible, while potentially valuable from a um, publication standpoint, because most referees are not going to understand this, is not inherently going to be giving you the right standard errors, quote unquote. Take that, that's like the, very much like the artisanship aspect of it. A lot of times if you do kind of less conservative standard errors, there may be concern on the part of referees or discussants or whomever else or audience members that you're not doing kind of, you're getting significance in your estimates because, oh, you're not, you know, you should be clustering something bigger. I think what is useful is to kind of build a positive, in the same way we talked about like making the positive case for your identification, Try to make the positive case for how you should be thinking about your inference. Well, here's the underlying estimate I'm interested in. We're fixing this population and we want to think about inference here. Um, what should we be thinking about? Okay, any questions? All right. So now let's talk about spatial and network error. So really we're gonna focus on spatial but the network one is not very different. Um, Clustering, the nice part about it is it has this really beautiful block structure where kind of the people in the same way that peer effects are easy when you just think about there being classrooms where everyone interacts the same within a classroom. Stuff gets a lot more complicated once you allow for the idea of there being correlation that differs for each person as a function of their distance from other people. So spatial correlation is typically defined as there's some correlation, say rho ij or sigma ij, which is a function of the distance between any two units. So think about people living on a surface, you know, I pick two points, the further you are away from one another, less correlated they are. And social network correlation is kind of done the same way where the distance here is, is, is done as a path length dif distance on a network. Um, this can especially matter when Sutva is violated because that's gonna create this kind of um, propagation of correlation. Uh, when you have Sutva though, when you're just thinking about there being random treatment and what you're worried about is this correlation, there's, not, there's this Berrios et al. paper um, in JASA in 2012 that shows that under SETFA, if you have treatments that are randomly assigned at a given cluster level, even if there's broader spatial, spatial spillovers. So an example of this would be in their paper, what they do is they say, let's consider the states in the United States. Some states have high minimum wage laws, some have low minimum wage laws. And we're interested in the effect of that on say income. Income has a really strong spatial component, as you might imagine, right? So that spills over across borders. So it's not just, it's not like every state is kind of its own island and it just has its own restricted. If you look across the border from Texas to Oklahoma, there's this very um, clear spatial correlation that exists. And so what you might worry about is you say, okay, well, I've got this correlation in my epsilon structure. And so I need to have this kind of spatial cluster randomization. And what this Barrios et al paper, and this is actually kind of the precursor to this that last paper we just talked about is saying that, well, if we randomly assign treatments at the state level, say minimum wage laws, that if it's truly randomly assigned in the sense that we sort of flipped coins and randomly assigned, or we had some assigned law, that we can ignore the spatial correlation. We can just treat it as if that correlation across units is irrelevant. Um, and that's very powerful because the nice thing about that, right, is that in a lot of cases when we're thinking about across states, we're going to assume that we have strict ignorability in some way. And so as a result, clustering on this, even though there's these spillovers across states, you can kind of um, adjust for that accordingly. What you worry about more is that, well, if clusters of states that are spatially correlated do minimum wage laws at the same time and their outcomes are spatially correlated, then you start to run into issues, right? Because you have correlation in the outcomes and correlation in the way that the laws are assigned. And so then that may um, cause issues with your inference. 
Uh, Conley has this 1999 paper where he shows how to do the clustering on, um, on spatial distances. So if any of you are interested in trade or are empiricists wanting to work on trade, this is a pretty common approach on the empirical side for this. So everybody kind of knows Conley 1999 as the approach to do. Really what he does is this, I mean this in the best way possible, this is a very simple um, way of taking Nui West estimators, which is what they do is they take windows where we say, all right, everyone within distance little d, we're going to allow them to be arbitrarily correlated. And then everyone outside that, so these are what are called Bartlett windows. Everyone outside these windows, we're going to force those to be zero. And, what, and then the idea is asymptotically, you're allowing the windows to get larger as you get more and more data. Um, and so windowing the estimates basically gives you a way of approximating um, the clustering because the idea is that people who are far away from one another are not really correlated. And so we're picking up most of the relevant pieces um, by focusing on the ones who are close by. This is, I mean, as you can see, it's been around for a long time. And uh, this estimator is, is probably consistent. You can do this in Stator and R. There are packages to do this and it's relatively straightforward. If you just Google Conley standard errors, is more there's estimators at the wazoo that you can use. So fine. So what? So spatial correlation can be a big deal. So consider the analogy to time series data. So in time series, you for those of you who have taken time series econometrics, this hopefully was beaten into you is that one of the big things we worry about there is dealing with high, highly autocorrelated data, right? So if we don't, if our data is autocorrelated and we treat it like it's not, that there's new, that there's basically we having, um, what's it called? Uh, random assignments, like independent assignments of our data that we're gonna really inflate our T statistics. So if we, if we don't adjust for this, that can be problematic. And so Kelly, um, this is a paper by Kelly from 2019 that is pretty provocative. Um, this paper is basically arguing that a lot of economic history papers are full of crap, more or less. I mean, he's re it's written as like a hit piece. I mean, if you wanna see somebody who has an ax to grind, it's worth reading this paper. Um, it's still not published. I, in my reading of it, I think it's basically pretty reasonable, but is written in a way to be as unconstructive as possible, which maybe reflects um, why he's having trouble with it. But the point of it is basically the following is imagine we took some modern outcome. So like city income and we correlate it with the regression on some historical characteristic like colonial boundaries, right? Which sounds like a lot of potential papers. Um, the claim in this paper is that the T statistics in these types of regressions are grossly amplified by spatial correlation. So think of this as being like you have autocorrelated data the same way in the time series. In, and this would be fixable with Conley standard errors. If you use Conley standard errors, you can adjust for exactly this problem. Um, I think the question that comes up, then he sort of talks about it as well, are people using wide enough windows or are they using this at all? But it, 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 it matters a lot in economic history, it matters for corporate governance, for, so for those who are financed in the audience, like you take the um, LLSV literature. So this is the L Laporta, some, another L, Schleifer and Vishni papers on colonial origins, right, of legal systems. Well, it turns out there's a lot of spatial correlation in the colonial origins, right? Like the British were all here and then the French were here, the Dutch were here, like there's huge amounts of correlation. And so the question becomes, what are you actually getting um, from this? And so, um, boy, my computer is really struggling. Uh, okay, no, nope, we're not there yet. So last, what I wanna say on this is that I, the claim that I wanna say, and I, I, this is not a result that I can point to in a paper, but I do think that if you think about this in a design-based framework, this becomes very natural, right? So similar to this minimum wage story, these are not experiments, right? What we're running where we think about colonial origins, 
we're asserting that there's some sort of strict ignorability, but we didn't actually flip a coin and say the Dutch go here, the French go here, the British go here. What we're asserting is some kind of experimental design. And given the amount of spatial correlation, it probably makes sense that we should say, well, actually, there's kind of a huge amount of clustering in terms of where people get assigned to. Like when people get assigned, X amount go here, X amount go here. And if we took that seriously, then a design-based approach to this would say, well, of course, we have to worry about clustering because correlating all the treatments in one place. And so that's going to cause already our inference about um, regression, about causal uncertainty to be off because there's so much within cluster correlation of the actual uh, design-based inference. So I, what I'm kind of trying to point to you is that if you saw someone, if you saw someone present a paper like this and you get an based hat on, you might say, rather than worrying about what kind of the error structure is of the, the variance matrix of the epsilon, you might say instead, okay, how is this, say we wanted to believe that colonial origins were as if randomly assigned. Do we actually think that like every country, there's just a coin flipped on whether or not they got civil origins or colonial or um, common law origins? No, probably what happens is that there's swaths of areas where people get assigned, where certain countries come in, that's gonna create correlation. And then if city income is also highly correlated across these places, then we need to adjust for these types of um, errors in these places. So anyway, that's kind of my my push for why you potentially want to worry about this in these settings. Um, this is like the one. This is the 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 final thoughts on this. Is I think of this stuff as being really hard. Um, I think we're covering like the simplest possible case for empirical methods, and there's still lots of things where we need a lot of notation, and we kind of have to really think hard about what, exactly what's going on and what is the estimate. And I frankly think that a lot of the ways that this stuff gets taught in econometrics historically um, is mechanically works, but then if you wanna start thinking about, well, what is my identifying experiment that I'm interested in becomes more challenging. So what I, I just wanna say, A, I think of this stuff as being very hard and I, I hope that at least when you, start, and you start thinking about them carefully that you also are finding it hard or maybe you'll find it easy now the second is that I really think that the key point here is asking what the estimate is that you're interested in is kind of really key. Um, and I think in not every situation that you guys will be working on, the results will be worked out. And so what I want to suggest next um, is it's really useful to consider simulating data. So there may be settings where what you would do is you would go to Peter Phillips and you'd say, hey, I'm doing this and I'm worried that there's X. And he may say, well, I don't know how to do that in blah, or he may have a result for you, or he may say it holds under X, Y, and Z condition. And you say, well, Y and Z don't apply for me. And then it's kind of, you're in an uncertain universe. And what I would suggest is remember, we're talking about asymptotics are kind of an approximation for your setting. Well, I would suggest trying to trying out what's going on in your setting if it's something that's somewhat unusual. Say you only have one treatment group. What does it look like if you kind of simulate data that looks similar to yours? How off are you going to be um, in these settings? So the last thing I just want to mention here is, um, so how to do simulations. You know, a lot of times when you're doing simulations, the goal is to generate data that matches your data sets um, distribution. So the marginal distribution of the underlying covariates, uh, the distribution of the outcomes, et cetera. But in a lot of, even for simple simulations, you have to make a lot of parametric assumptions. So we talked about those simulations at the very beginning. Uh, there you had to assume stuff was normal uh, just because it's easy and that may not match your underlying data. There's a very cool paper by um, Athey and co-authors forthcoming in the Journal of Econometrics where they propose a method for matching the data as closely as possible using this generative uh, adversarial network approach. This is like a machine learning um, based method. And the idea is, basically construct distributions that match the true data as closely as possible. This is really kind of computationally intensive, but I really think if you want to do this and say you're working your job market paper and you, you, know, you really want to be able to nail this down, this is something worth exploring. Um, there's code available online, there's documentation online. This is something I, I think it would be worth exploring. 
you certainly don't have an excuse that you don't know how to simulate your data. There are approaches um, that are doable. That being said, it's really, really meant. Um, my former classmate, Alex Pisakovich, got on my case because, you know, there's a lot a lot of hyperparameters. There's a, there's a lot of, let's say, unholy magic that goes into the plots you see in a GAN paper. What good, does best, blah, blah, blah. It's worth doing, but probably not a homework question. And then Susan says, even students in my lab don't use the package when time is tight. So um, it takes fiddling, but I think it's useful to think about this as an approach to do. I, I don't know if this will take off as a potential way to do this, but if you're working on something where you're concerned about this and you really have the time to kind of make sure that you're worried that simulating from traditional distributions is gonna mess up what's going on, you know, think about simulating stuff uh, with, with this after trying something simple, say with normals, or if you have an intuition about what the issue is, try something simple initially and then go from there. Or, I mean, we're not gonna get into it, but you know, hopefully you've at least seen, bootstrapping is worth trying in a lot of settings just to give yourself a sense of how much are the asymptotics um, relevant for what's going on. Okay, uh, I'm gonna stop there. Does anyone have any questions?